Revision of the International Guidelines on Seafarer Medical Examination. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Tim Carter and, of course, our very loyal speaker, Dr. Honolan. Let's give them both a round of applause. Admiral, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting us here today. Um, Alf Magna has worked very hard all through the morning. I've come to it fresh now. Um, I'm just fascinated when I look at the two symbols up here for the Norwegian Centre and for the Naval Services here. We have a sm small, cold, blue snake. You have a much bigger green snake with tropical vegetation all around it. If they get together and mate, what are their babies going to be like? <laughs> so I hope, I hope there'll be some and they'll be interesting. Um, well, I'm going to talk about international aspects of telemedical advisory services and then hand over to Ralph Magna to talk about uh, the services in Norway. Um, now, this is a slide you'll see again because it's one of Alf Magna's. It just gives the scope of maritime health and what determines ill health at sea. And we're going to be talking particularly about the quality of telemedical advisory services, training of doctors for all them, cooperation between them and other parts of the healthcare system and search and rescue system, the equipment, the availability of specialist advice and the means of communication. Um, now, one of the first things to think about with telemedical services is who they talk to. Um, they don't exist for any reason other than to help people deal with medical problems that arise at sea. Um, and um, this is where it's quite important to think about how they interact with people. They're obviously interacting with the ill or injured seafarer. They're interacting with the carers on board the ship who've got responsibilities to look after that person while they're at sea. But they're also having to deal with shore-based search and rescue services who usually task helicopters and other means of evacuation. They have to talk to communications providers who provide um, internet links, satellite links, and other things um, that are needed to communicate from ship to shore. They have to contact onshore hospitals um, about where casualties can be landed and treated effectively. And they obviously also have to talk to telemedical and search and rescue services in other countries because they may well be advising a ship which is much nearer to say the Australian coast than it is to the coast of Thailand. And so if there's a casualty, it will have to be landed in another country. And this makes it quite important to have standardized documentation um, so that the information is collected appropriately on board the ship. There is a standard set of documents that goes with the seafarer when they go ashore and that the whole event is properly recorded in the ship's log and also recorded, obviously, by the telemedical center. Um, how do telemedical services come about? Um, most of the established ones are state services. There are a number of international conventions that require maritime nations to provide telemedical services um, in ILO, in the EEC directive, and there are a number of things about search and rescue in IMO conventions, which also relate indirectly to telemedical services. Um, one of the key things in this is this very idealistic statement in the Maritime Labor Convention. Uh, there's a requirement on essentially flag states to ensure that seafarers are given health protection and medical care as comparable as possible to that which is generally available to workers ashore including prompt advice to the necessary medicines, medical equipment and facilities for diagnosis and treatment and to medical information and expertise. Now, clearly somebody remote from hospital care who needs hospital treatment can't have exactly equivalent service, but this is a statement which is what the maritime 
sector should aspire to in terms of quality of care. And it's quite a challenging one to handle, and we're frankly a long way away from it now. Um, more specifically, the Convention requires that the competent authority shall ensure by a prearranged system that medical advice by radio or satellite communication to ships at sea, including specialist advice, is available 24 hours a day, etc. Um, now, that, that is the basic doc statement that requires flag states to have a telemedical advisory service in place, and as such is very key. If you signed up to the Maritime Labour Convention and you haven't got a service, you're not meeting the essential standards in that code. And there are quite a lot of countries in the world that don't meet them at present. Um, before I go back to who does what, let's just think about the functions of a telemedical service. Um, it gives advice on care at sea. Um, I put down diagnosis and treatment, but it's not really diagnosis and treatment as it's thought of on shore. It's giving advice to a ship's officer who will have had a small amount of training in uh, medical care and first aid and may only see one serious casualty every four or five years. So it's dealing with somebody who's essentially unprepared. Um, and it's particularly giving advice on use of medications which are being carried on ship and how to observe a person who's ill or injured to see if they develop any complications. Um, with also additional advice if it may be an infection on how to prevent it spreading. Sometimes this is one-off advice. Quite often it will be advice given over several days about how to treat a seriously ill or injured person on board a ship. The second main function is to give advice which almost always has to be jointly with the search and rescue services on the possibilities for either evacuating the person from the ship or for diverting the ship to the nearest port so that the person can have treatment. And it is also liaison with hospitals ashore. For instance, if you have somebody who has a serious head injury from a fall on board a ship, you need them to go to a hospital that has neurosurgical facilities. And so that is something where you have to know enough about the case if they're being evacuated to say where the helicopter should be tasked to land to get the person to the right hospital. Um, and also, they obviously need to advise hospitals on the state of a person as they come in. Are they likely to need very urgent surgical treatment that the surgical team might need to be called in for, for instance? So all this means that the telemedical service needs to know, a, the people in it need to know a lot about medicine, but they also need to know quite a lot about the maritime world and what can be done and can't be done. Um, and also, a big other difficulty is they need to know about issues of confidentiality and ethics as they affect seafarers, because medical information suddenly becomes public in the setting of transmitting it from a ship to shore. So what safeguards do you have that that information isn't misused? And you may have either a ship's master who wants to avoid an expensive diversion despite a seafarer being ill, or alternatively wants to get a troublesome seafarer off the ship and ashore when there isn't a medical need. And so they've got to understand the ethics and the relationships that exist um, on board ship and make sure they're giving medically sound advice and they're not being used to give bad advice because it suits somebody else's interests. Um, they've also got to understand the realities and the rigours of evacuation, either moving an injured person to another vessel, which can be quite difficult and dangerous in a bad sea, or arranging helicopter evacuation, for which there are a number of quite specific contraindications about who can and who can't safely be evacuated by helicopter. Um, so they need quite a lot of background knowledge. They need spoken and written English, because English is the common communications language in the maritime sector. And one weakness is that 
formal maritime English is not designed so you convey information about he health problems. And so it may need quite a lot of careful discussion and innovation. They need to know about different sorts of ships, what is possible on a fishing vessel, what's possible on an offshore support vessel, etc. They need to know about dangerous cargoes because you may have risks from gassing or skin contamination on a chemical tanker. They also need to know or need to work with a Joint Rescue Coordination Centre about where medical facilities are available all around the world. They need to know about what's on board the ship, what should be in the medicine chest, what training ship's officers should have, and what medical guides they should be carrying. And one of the big problems is often the medicines are from a different country with different names on them, or um, the training is defective because different countries train in detail in different ways, um, or they've lost the medical guide so they can't follow the advice in it. They need to know what's available on different sorts of ship in terms of a sick bay and where a person can go, and they obviously need to know about the world of um, evacuation, helicopter support, search and rescue services. And they need to know where they are in a disciplined environment, who advises, who decides. And there are often three players in this. The ship's master, the telemedical support service, and the search and rescue services, all of which have their own ideas about what's good for the ship, what's good for the individual, and whether it's safe to fly a helicopter. So there's got to be a lot of careful understanding of the other players in it. Um, even within Europe, there's quite a lot of national variation in actual provision of telemedical services. Um, some have dedicated personnel who do it. Others use hospital emergency departments to provide the care. Um, and there are contradictory things. If you've got specialists dedicated to it, they may or may not have good links with hospital specialists. If you have a hospital emergency department doing it, it may not always, or all the staff may not understand about the risks of working at sea. So you, you have different models even within a fairly developed area of the world. If you go worldwide, um, there are even bigger differences. Europe generally is in line with the international conventions. The USA has limited provision that puts a duty on ship operators to make their own arrangements with a commercial service as well. In the developing world, there are relatively few TMAS services, although ship operators often have informal arrangements uh, with company doctors. Um, quite a lot of the energy and cruise sectors actually buy into well-developed private services which exist of one sort and another. They're prepared to pay for it to get the quality and they often buy into them quite remotely. I mean, a cruise ship will have a doctor on it, but if they want advice on a radiograph or want a surgical expert, they may go through to a center in the United States wherever they are in the world. And the final thing is languages. Often a ship's officer will prefer to talk to a TMAS which speaks his own native language than go to the nearest one. I mean, in the UK, which I know well, we have quite a lot of Polish masters on ships and they would much prefer to talk to the Polish TMAS centre because they can talk in their own language about symptoms and things than they would talk to the UK or the Norwegian one. So there's a language issue too. Now, communication to the next international issue. Traditionally, it's been radio, telephone, oral communication. Um, increasingly, um, historically, fax and more recently, email have, incre have replaced this, giving a written record of transfers, but less easy real-time communication. And they're quite good for facts, but often what a ship's officer needs is reassurance or immediate advice or interaction and that's where voice comes in. Um, still images have often been sent, particularly for things like skin disease or injuries, sending a picture can be useful. Um, or sending a recorded moving image in the same way. 
One of the biggest things which doesn't really exist but is possible now is live two-way video in real time. I'll come back to communication shortly, but it is feasible as a cost to provide live two-way video to most <coughs> ships now. One of the key things about communications is standardizing protocols um, so that the information is transferred in a way that it's received in an uncorrupted way. And this has issues about satellite coverage, bandwidth, and cost. And in fact, satellite coverage for the world on Inmarsat is really pretty good now. All except the very high Arctic and Antarctic have continuous coverage from Inmarsat satellites. So if you're prepared to buy the bandwidth, you could actually do live video from almost anywhere in the oceans of the world. But that is a step too far for a lot of the maritime industry and for a lot of the state TMAS at present. What's been going on recently? Um, IMA has organized two relevant workshops on this, um, and the reports of both are available on the IMHA website. Um, we had a consensus workshop on telemedical advisory services in Malta in 2013, um, and this was really where the need for common communication protocols and the value of two-way videos um, both to enable diagnosis and examination to be watched and supervised and also to help people and guide them through procedures it seemed to be the biggest single thing that would be advantageous. Um, and we had another related workshop at the beginning of this year looking at wider issues on medical care at sea and recognizing that while we have international conventions, there are a lot of divergences in national practice which are increasingly getting dangerous. And we need to move to a framework which, as Alf Magna was saying earlier, is more international and is probably based on a much more structured approach to agreed care pathways and decision trees, which ships have, seafarers are trained in, and telemedical services know about. And I will stop at this stage and hand over to Alf Magna. Is somebody providing me with a presentation, or is it is it here? It's somewhere. Oh, it, it is there here. It is here. We have this. Here. There you are. Good. Over to you. Fine. It's all open and ready. Yeah, here it is. <coughs> um, uh, first of all, a short history of uh, the Radio Medico Norway, which is the name of it, RMN. It started in 1949. Uh, with, of course, free of charge for all ships when at sea. Others may access the service through pre-made arrangements, and uh, we have such agreements and arrangements with uh, different types. If you're looking at, uh, at offshore mobile units, they are ships when they are moving, but they are under the petroleum legislation, and uh, they are not regarded as ships if they are anchored and they are drilling or, or doing something else in, uh, in an operation which is fixed uh, in, in relation to the seabed. So they are ships and they are not ships, it changes. But uh, the crew on board uh, will be pretty much the same. And they, are not, uh, they have not access to a free service when they are anchored and when they are a petroleum offshore unit, and then they have to pay if they want this. They then sometimes have a different service which is organized by the company itself, or they pay for a service with us money which is uh, very much welcome because we can use that for further development. And users come from all parts uh, of the maritime sector. Down left is that ship which, were, uh, which we uh, had a service for up in Baffin Bay. And uh, there are military ships, there are small vessels, there are bigger vessels. There is an offshore supply vessel on the right bottom and the one on the, on the left bottom also is this research vessel. The primary way of contact is preferred uh, to be um, voice, and it should always be through the coastal station. And uh, there, there are possibility to use other telemedical ways of communication, like email and still pictures, which very often is much better than video. I remember one, one thing they, they tried onshore in Norway. 
they would uh, like uh, the ambulance to carry a, a, a video camera with them, and they came to the site of a, of a trauma, and it was, uh, I think it was uh, a car crash or something, and, uh, and they took a video of what they could see of the patient who, who had a, a fracture somewhere, I can't recall where it was, but what happened when they got this video and in the hospital was that they stopped it to look at the still picture because that was much more informative than looking at something which was moving. So it is not always like video is better than a still picture. It could just as good be the opposite way around. So do not forget the still pictures. They are very informative. Video conference is uh, something that, is, that video really could be used for. If you have a psychiatric case on board a ship and you can see the patient and you can talk to the patient via video, that will tell you so much more than you, what you can get of information if the mate is reporting to you how the, the individual is behaving uh, in the sick bay, which is far away from the bridge where he can communicate from. So uh, there, is, there, of course, are possibilities. But then they can use Inmarsat satellite communication, they can use radio, and they can use telephone and email and whatever. Um, <clears throat> there is also a possibility to stream medical information from electromedical equipment and, and get parameters uh, like uh, uh, what could be measured uh, on these emergency nice units you can put on board a ship. Uh, so there is a possibility to convey such information also. I, I think this is a too complicated picture, but if you have got the handout, you can, you can read it how many times you want afterwards, but it describes the a rather complicated interaction between the radio medical service, the Joint Rescue Coordination Center, and the coastal station and the ship uh, from uh, something happens until it is solved in one or another way. So looking at telephone, the benefits is always the fastest way to establish contact, the least time consuming way to, do, uh, to have a consultation, and it's real time and it's interactive. So telephone is good. Drawbacks is that it's hard to get accurate descriptions because you can't see, some, see anything. It's hard to verify doctor's assumptions and captain's understanding of instructions. And it's sometimes we have seen episodes where things, thing, uh, information has been misunderstood and, uh, and the recommendations have not been followed up and uh, in some cases this has been fatal to the sick seafarer. It's challenging with language differences and, uh, and that is uh, probably the biggest barrier to a well-functioning TEMA service worldwide today. Still sometimes bad quality on sound. Moving to email, you can get detailed information about static conditions. It's good for documentation, can be of help to overcome language barriers. Drawbacks it is slow, it's not interactive. If questions are unclear or answered in an unclear way, this generates many mails. But it's good for documentation. What is written is written, and you can revisit that text whenever you want afterwards. And uh, when the lawyers come and want uh, to blame you that somebody died on board the ship, it's very good to have written documentation, I can assure you. That's much better than, I think I can recall that what I said was. That sounds not so good. A video <coughs> uh, largely increases the quality of dynamic information. It could be different types of, of uh, neurological exams, assessments of pain, consciousness, etc. How you could move your limbs, how you look in your face, expressions. Do you look depressed? Do you look anemic? Do you look wild in your eyes? Whatever. It gives better possibilities to supervise and guide when treatment procedures is performed on board. If you have ordered the, the, uh, the mate to do something with the ill seafarer, and you have ordered him to please put your hand on his abdomen and check for, for pain, and he's doing this completely wrong, you can say, well, it's not like that you do it. Uh, or uh, you should do this and that and such and, and such. Or it could be that you have ordered him to put a shoulder back in place if it was out of, of joint. And then it is very much uh, uh, information you can get from a video supervision of what he's doing. And you can say, no, no, put your foot in his axilla. 
uh, not like that, but like that. Ah, yeah, this looks good. So it's much better to instruct with the video supervision. And it can also be of help to overcome language barriers sometimes. Drawbacks, still limited use on board ships. It is time consuming. And both doctors and remote practitioners needs a certain level of training in using the equipment. Uh, we also have some additional services, uh, training with vessels. Uh, crew on board vessels are trained in medical care in certain of the safety training centers in Norway. And some of them have an agreement with us so that they also train their um, participants in communication with the TMOS. And that we also do towards ships. Some shipping companies uh, are very much eager that their crew members should train with uh, uh, or exercise with uh, the TMOS, and we allow them to do that. We encourage that and think that is very important. Um, yeah. <clears throat> We also have a course in, in training remote practitioners, uh, or it more, more or less it is not actually a very well designed course, but it is, um, it is uh, a meeting where we are discussing and uh, asking questions back and forth, and they are trying the equipment and such things. Uh, and this is uh, one of these uh, training uh, sessions. I think I will drop this. Yes, this is the number of calls from ships to Norwegian uh, Radio Medical and its needs for external assistance. And as you can see, the biggest one is Medico and the next one is engine failure. So, and down to collision, which is eight as compared to 2,379 Medico calls. It's more than 40% of all maritime distress requests to Norwegian authorities in 2014. So who do we see? Well, it's mostly males. 80%, um, 75% are males. And there are some females, and there are some we don't know who they are. What about age? Well, we have seen them from one year old to 93, I think, the oldest one. And uh, of course, we have a passenger ferry going from Norway to Denmark with elderly and drunken people every day. And a uh, and lot of things happen on board. They have a paramedic, but not a doctor. And they account for a lot of, of call to us. Nationality, most of them are Norwegians. The, the next big group are Filipinos. And then there are different others from, from other countries. The diagnosis we see, uh, a lot of them is uh, digestive and musculoskeletal. There are skin and respiratory tract, and, uh, and then I think we have most of them. There are some eye conditions, uh, getting things into your eyes not very good. If you had used your protection, that would probably not happen. But this is how the diagnosis in, in the ICPC2 system is used. We do not use the ICD-10 diagnostic system because it is inappropriate at sea. We do not have a proper medical rec uh, history. We do not have a clinical examination by a doctor. We do not have supplementary tests that can tell us anything. So we uh, do not have the accuracy to use ICD-10. It is improper. So we use ICPC-2, which is International Classification for Primary Care. And there you have a lot of symptom diagnosis and you have sampled a lot of other diagnosis of conditions into bigger boxes. So you have abdominal pain. That's a good diagnosis. That's correct. But it's hard to say that it is an appendicitis. You can guess, but you can't be sure. And uh, you can know it is chest pain, but do you know which type of chest pain it is? You shouldn't dare to use the ICD-10 in such cases. It is much better to use the ICPC, and it is the second edition we are using, ICPC-2. Yeah. There is a lot of, uh, of um, problems with teeth, and that is what you can experience from any radio medical service and also for ship medical doctors. The most usual reason why crew members uh, visit doctor in port is teeth problems. It's odontology. And, uh, and that is uh, something to remind all those who do medical examination for pre-employment purposes that they really 
ask the CFRA to open his mouth and have and check up what's, what's in there, because that is a big, big problem. If you look at how many occupational related incidents we had in 2014, uh, there was, uh, of all the requests we got, 13.6% were occupational injuries, and there were 5% of occupational suspected disease. Uh, so this is, this is something we can do something with if we are increasing our efforts in prevention. There is something to do with occupational diseases and incidents. They can't all be avoided, but you can reduce the numbers more than this. So this tells me that it's not just happening. There are, there are causes we can influence. We could do something for this. Just a few examples of, of steel pictures. These are real cases. It's very easy to have a uh, to, to look at the eye when you see a picture like this. And most mobile phones can, can take pictures like this. So everybody have a, uh, have a possibility to take a photo, and then you can connect it to the computer and send it to the doctor on shore. And you also can see how the wound is, and you can see uh, the blisters. The medical evacuations uh, were mostly by helicopter, and some were by deviation and there were a few to other vessels, mostly to Coast Guard vessels out in the Norwegian uh, economic zone, where we have Coast Guard vessels far out at sea. So that happened sometimes. And the medevac diagnosis were mainly circulatory. There were some musculoskeletal. There were general and unspecified, which was the biggest group then, together with digestive. Some neurological, less respiratory, a few skin, and then urology on the bottom of this list. For more information regarding Radio Medical Norway, please contact us, and um, you can send an email to, to the leader of the Radio Medical Service, Agna Tveten, on adminradiomedical.no. You can visit Radio Medical on Twitter and Facebook, and you can visit the website, which is a part of the NCMM website, so just visit www.ncmm.no and you will find Radio Medical Service there under the heading Medical Advice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter and Dr. Honeyland. That was such an outstanding talk. You have really captured our attention. And may I call again Dr. Tanawat to give us a short summary and raise our question. Thank you. Thank you again, both of you, for the uh, presentation about the TMAS, as you said, telemedical assistance service. Also, with the difficulty your experience and the challenging on board that you have found, so it's quite difficult. I understand, and the language problem we are facing because we are happy with speaking Thai, but in very short period we are going for AEC, so English would be needed in a very short period. So right now I'll do a little brief in Thai and I'll be waiting for the question and answer from the floor. ก็ <coughs> 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 เขาใช้คําว่าเป็น TMAS ก็คือเป็น Telemedical Assistance Service ก็คือเป็นการให้คําปรึกษาฉุกเฉินทาง 24 ชั่วโมงตัวหนึ่งที่สําคัญคือ MLC 2006 นะครับที่ข้อที่จะมีการส่งคําปรึกษาต่อกับแพทย์เฉพาะทางในแต่ละโรคนะครับผมซึ่งจากเดิมที่เราเข้าใจว่ายิ่งใช้เทคโนโลยีขั้นสูงยิ
บางทีก็อาจจะได้ข้อมูลที่ค่อนข้างเยอะนะครับของไทยอาจจะใช้เวลาสักพักใหญ่ๆไปถึงจุดนั้นเพราะยังเป็นเครือข่ายมดดำอะไรอยู่แล้วก็ยังเป็นโทรศัพท์ผ่านดาวเทียมนะครับก็จะใช้เวลาในการดําเนินการแต่ว่าถ้าเกิดอย่างเช่นบางกรณีที่ที่ส่วนตัวที่มีประสบการณ์ที่เขาทําในแมทริกนะครับก็คือว่าหมอเนี่ยนั่งอยู่ในห้องโรงพยาบาลอยู่ในแมดริดเลยแล้วส่งวิดีโอเรียลไทม์มาจากเรือที่อยู่ในโซนแอฟริกาส่องกล้องโอโตสโคปสองหูข้างในและคุณภาพสูงมากที่หมอ ENT สามารถนั่งอยู่ในแมดริดเราบอกได้ว่าให้ช่วยขยับโอโตสโคปซ้ายหรือขวาหน่อยเพื่อจะได้เห็นชัดเจนแล้วให้การวินิจฉัยเราสั่งการรักษาได้ด้วยนะครับในกรณีอย่างเช่นอย่างนั้นเนี่ยจะได้ใช้เทคโนโลยีขั้นสูงนะครับแต่เขาก็บอกว่าบางทีก็ไม่จําเป็นต้องใช้ขั้นสูงมากนะครับสุดท้ายก็คือประเด็นที่เขาเพิ่มก็คือว่าในการให้ในการให้รหัสโรคอย่างเช่นว่าที่เราคุ้นกันว่าใช้ ICD-10 นะครับซึ่ง ICD-10 มันจะเป็นการยืนยันชัดเจนอย่างเช่นว่าต้องลง acute appendicitis ก็คือต้องรู้แน่นอนว่าเป็นไส้ติ่งอักเสบเฉียบพลันซึ่งถ้าเราเป็นผู้รับฟังข้อมูลจากการฟังแล้วเนี่ยต้องใช้มโนภาพคือต้องใช้ต้องต้องมโนตามให้ทันจินตนาการให้ถึงฉะนั้นเนี่ยระบบการใหรหัสของเขาจะต่างไปเขาจะใช้ตัว ICPC คือเป็น International Classification of Primary Care เป็นเวอร์ชันที่2ซึ่งก็จะเป็นลักษณะการระบุภาพรวมว่าการจะป่วยครั้งนี้อาจจะเขียนแค่ว่าเป็น Acute Abdomen คือปวดท้องฉุกเฉินฉะนั้นเนี่ยจะเขียนภาพรวมเพราะบางทีเราอาจจะระบุไม่ได้นะครับอันนี้ก็คือสิ่งที่เขาเล่ามาทั้งหมดในประสบการณ์ที่ผ่านมานะครับก็ต่อไปก็จะเรียนเชิญในที่ประชุมครับไม่ทราบว่ามีใครมีคำถามไหมครับ Now is the time for question and answers First I take my chance I haven't asked yet So uh, about the cons consultation from outside So what is the specialty the doctor specializations that you consult the most from the incidents on board So you said you have a lot of musculoskeletal some of the skin so what is the main specializations that you, you do concern the most well 95% um, of what happens is uh, regular general practice and family medicine and um, <clears throat> the real urgent cases is less than 1% uh, so even if emergency medicine is first it is not the biggest. So emergency medicine is very good to have, <clears throat> but you really need some experience in uh, a broader discipline, uh, which is covering things that emergency doctors never see, because that's the most usual thing you will have out there. So <clears throat> emergency medicine is important because sometimes you have that, but what you are lacking is the follow-up you have on shore. The patient will not be in the hospital in one hour. There will be no hospital department taking over the treatment, but he will stay on board for one week or two weeks. And during this period of time, you have to do something which you usually do not do with, with, out patients, uh, with patients outside hospital. So you need to be well experienced, and uh, internal medicine would be very important. Surgery would be very important. Emergency medicine is of importance and general practice. So, if you have someone with this com this this competence, he would be perfect. And uh, and uh, probably you don't have that. But if you have a, a very specialized cardiologist who knows everything about left bundle branch block and nothing about anything else, you can't use him. Thank you very much. He also recommends. He says that. คือมีหลายมุมมองก็คือจริงๆแล้วไม่ได้อยากได้วิทยาศาสตร์ฉุกเฉินแค่อย่างเดียวก็จะเป็นหลายด้านนะครับเพราะว่าจะมีทั้งการติดตามการรักษายาวๆเพราะว่าอาจจะไม่ใช่คอนเสิร์ตแบบด่วนๆแต่ว่าต้องตามดูเพราะคนพวกนี้อยู่บนเรือยหลายวันอาจจะเป็นอาทิตย์นะครับก็คําตอบอาจจะตอบยากแต่ว่าก็ต้องการความรู้ที่หลากหลายและรู้ทางด้านมาริทามเมดในสุดท้ายครับเนนเชิญ so uh, may I ask you some question uh, you said that you have the doctor five doctors to do seven days, 24 hours, right? So uh, if I need to be consultation, so I ask if I 
have the telephone. So the first that pick up the telephone is the med dispatch, medical dispatcher, or can I uh, talk to the doctor right now? And the doctor can have uh, answer my question in that time. Because of that, uh, they, usually, they usually have a response time uh, on, on three to five minutes. And um, uh, if they are occupied, <clears throat> because they are doing this uh, uh, besides other work, uh, so if they are occupied and cannot, take, can, cannot pick up the phone if it should call, then another of the doctors are dedicated for those hours or this period of time. They are, are working um, on, on the special terms. They are not uh, doing only this work, and that is why we are looking for uh, doctors doing only this work now because it is increasing so much and uh, <clears throat> a telephone call when you're treating patients on the telephone you're not just saying oh, I think you need to visit the hospital so please come in and goodbye it's not that the telephone communication with that patient on board a ship can be for hours and uh, and they take a long time so in between it's it's really hard work so it is now almost on the limit that it can't be combined with other work. But so far, they have combined it with other work. And they have their phone on them all the time. If they know they are standing in front of an audience or giving a lecture, they phone one of the other guys and, and give a message, notify the coastal station, I'll be out of reach for two hours, and in this period, contact this doctor. So they are always prepared like this. And they also, have, they also carry computers. Where they can um, where they can use video consultation, and they have the medical record on the laptops, where they can we can use it anywhere if there is Wi-Fi coverage or if they have a mobile data possibility. So, so this is how they work, <clears throat> and the response time is usually three to five minutes. Can I just on that one? You provide a <coughs> dedicated phone just for yeah. telemedical use. So yeah. you know if that phone rings, then that's a telemedical call. Yeah. So that's the other important clue. That's it's correct. not just your usual phone, but it's a dedicated one. There is a hotline. Oh. Okay, uh, and if the patient have to have the medical evacuation, is it your work that uh, to contact the hospital on shore to be, have a readiness or it will be the Joint Rescue Coordination Center taking care of it. And they are in the same loop. So it's just uh, one switch and then the Joint Rescue Coordination Center is on the line. And they have all the same information in their database. So they can take over in seconds and say, we are doing this. So, so, and they can use the Coast Guard vessels if they want. They can send out the helicopter if they want. They can call other ships in the neighborhood uh, or whatever <coughs> it should be needed. So, um, so that's the way it works. So the tripartite cooperation with the coastal station being the communication and the switchboard for the whole service with a direct line to the Joint Rescue Coordination Center and to the Radio Medical Service. And, uh, and any, any one of, of the three can alarm any one of the others. Okay, thank you very much. But also there is an international network of uh, joint rescue centers which is very central to this that you will often have a seafarer well outside your own maritime limits. And so the Joint Rescue Centre in Norway or the UK may well contact another one in Japan, say, and make arrange, get that centre to take over the arrangements, giving the right medical details so that they know where to aim the person for in the hospital in Japan. That is correct, and at the same time, I think that the Joint Rescue Coordination Center in Stavanger is conducting medical evacuation uh, in foreign waters and, and far away twice a week the year round. So, um, because they, they, cannot, uh, they cannot forward the call or give the task to uh, um, a more uh, nearer located and more appropriate uh, uh, coordination center. So one day I was in and visiting the coordination center. They had two medical evacuation at the same time. One was in the Black Sea, and the other one was in the Caribbean. And they were conducted from, from Stavanger, both of them. If you're looking at the Arctic waters, and if you are going the Northeast Passage, 
um, then there are difficulties. There is one uh, maritime coordination center in, uh, uh, in Murmansk, I think, and, or Arkhangelsk, I think it is. And then the next one is in Vladivostok, and there's nothing in between. So uh, along, all the, along around the, the whole South Siberian coast, there is nothing. And, uh, and, and this is quite challenging, thinking of using this passage for transportation and for transport now in the future. So there are a lot of things to discuss in this area, but uh, this is how it works. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, you just answer, because uh, the European uh, navigation and uh, international navigation is uh, sometimes big difference. So uh, the limit of the medicine on board may be uh, difference also. And then our country is a monsoon uh, country climate. So then uh, maybe the medicines uh, should be different from uh, other countries, something like that. My question is, uh, in European navigation and international navigation, the uh, limited of the medicine on board, is the same or not the same? I mean, uh, we have the ILO list of the medicine on board. Yeah, we, we have the many kinds of medicine on board. This is, uh, we should have the certificate for the medicine also. Yeah, please. I think it's a complicated one because internationally, the world is in a muddle about which medicines to carry on board ships. Um, first of all, in Europe, there is a European Union directive on medicines to be carried, which has been mentioned earlier, which is quite old. But effectively, any country, EA, should be carrying a common system of medicines. They may differ in detail, but they've got to be, cover certain generic areas of medicine. Um, in other countries, it's more variable because there is a rather unsatisfactory list from the WHO. Uh, because it is based on their list of medicines for developing countries. Uh, and it doesn't include particularly simple remedies for dealing with colds or dealing with piles, hemorrhoids. Um, it doesn't have the right things on it. And for instance, it doesn't have a seasickness remedy on it. Mm -hmm. um, it has an antiemetic for another purpose. So it is something which Alf Magno and I, through IMHA, have been trying to get people to recognize the need to revise the medicines list and make it more standardized. There can be other difficulties too. For instance, a lot of Chinese ships carry their own medicine chest of traditional Chinese remedies as well, which no team mass service can advise on which of those to use because they're a wholly different system of medicine. So it is an unsatisfactory position. Um, it needs more work doing on it. But it needs work doing which coordinates training and medical guides with this. I think you mentioned different climates. Um, in terms of medical emergencies, the pattern of emergencies doesn't vary much. What does vary is the local knowledge from search and rescue services about the practicability of evacuations by different methods in different places. That's the most important bit of local knowledge of what the weather conditions are like. Is it safe to fly a helicopter? Because the, the real evacuations are not risk-free. There are risks to the helicopter pilots and crew members from attempting an evacuation in bad weather. And that's a very difficult balance between saving the life of a seafarer and putting helicopter crew members or lifeboat crew members at risk in doing that rescue. And that's something that search and rescue have to decide for themselves. And the pilot of a helicopter finally has to decide, is it safe to fly? Thank you so much. Another one question is, uh, as uh, from presentation, you can get the very good information data information system very well. You can get the like a uh, Norwegian seafarer, like a uh, uh, 
when they got the injury, uh, how to uh, recommend for that one. Now, uh, in Thailand, uh, look like uh, we try to make a one-stop service to be keep on information. That means uh, we can research in the future. Yeah, what uh, like uh, happening, CFR6, what kind of uh, disease or something, something like that. Yeah, okay, that, that one uh, in Norwegian. My question is, uh, have you got any one-stop service to conclude for all of information or not? Or of the CFR information, which uh, uh, like a department to conclude everything? Um, let me tell you about another country. The most integrated system, I think, is in Spain, where they have a system that the TMAS doctor can see the seafarer's medical examination records and details of any past hospital empl employment. That's because of the way their social security system works. Yes. Very few, if any, other countries can record link across the whole of a seafarer's data set. Um, but there is an important thing, even for the TMAS service, you need to be able to produce the sort of data which Alf Magnet has shown you from Norway, not least because it costs you to run the service and you need to prove what it's doing. So you need that data for your own survival as a service, as well as to learn from it and learn what you can do better in future. Okay. Thank you very much. ขอบคุณมากครับก็ถ้าไม่มีคําถามนะครับพอดีล่วงเลยเวลามาสักนิดนึงก็ยังไงต้องขอบคุณนะครับผู้เข้าร่วมประชุมทุกท่านแล้ว